me here on time. Like I said just two minutes ago, these sessions are being recorded. If you have a question, you can wait till the end of the session. I'll go ahead and pause the recording, but stop the recording so you can ask your questions. But if you're not shy, please go ahead and chat with me or raise your hand and Lindsay will let me know. Okay, so this is great. What we have today is a topic that all of us on this call most of the time see, right? Because Temp workers are hired through a maybe a staffing agency, or maybe you have a PEO relationship going on there at your place of employment, and they vary slightly. And so what I want to bring to you today is what are the issues with Kalosha compliance? It is huge. It really is a huge issue because there is a emphasis from OSHA and Cal OSHA in regards to how many of, of how many places of employment, how many companies OSHA goes to inspect because they have temporary workers on their site. So there's an emphasis. Uh, both federal and California OSHA have temporary workers on their main page as a main concern. And so we're going to talk about why. And it's simple. I'll tell you why. One of the main things is because these people, they're awesome. They get to you. They want to work. They're not going to be there for too long. Some of you do become permanent workers, which changes a little bit the relationship there. But when they are temp workers, man, every time they go to a different job site, they are a new worker. And for those of you that have been with me throughout this couple of years, we started these webinars back when the pandemic hit. But now we've transitioned them into safety topics for you because we know you're paying attention. You want to keep people safe at work. New workers statistically get hurt on the first days of job, the first week of their job. So because those statistics and those numbers are high, they pay attention and voila, now we know that a lot of those workers are temp workers. And guess what? These workers get to be new workers many times during the year. So this is why there's an emphasis there. So I wanna make sure also I give you both sides, you know, protect the workers, they're your resources. They are the reason how, the reason why we make a profit and we keep our employment and we get our economy going, right? But also we have, that responsibility as nurse directors, as safety people, as you know, your position at your company is to protect your company also from fines, penalties, citations, complaints to OSHA, right? And how do we do this? By really keeping a good, strong, effective injury and illness prevention program. So just a quick disclaimer, remember this is facilitating information to you. We don't talk about specific, um, safety issues that apply to your particular industry. But if you have a question, please do ask it. I am not an attorney. I am a consultant and I am also an outreach OSHA trainer, which means I have the authorization to go out there and federally and Cal OSHA, I have both uh, authorizations for construction and for general industry to teach the 10 hour and the 30 hour OSHA classes. So I, I really love safety. I know you do too. And that's why you're here. So that's a quick disclaimer. Oh, and that's a, a, a little chat there for Lindsay because I know you guys want the CEUs. Awesome. What are our learning objectives? And this is also important for you guys if you're doing training at your facilities, you've got to always give your audience learning objectives. So when we finish today after this one hour webinar, you got to have clear in your mind what dual employment means under Cal OSHA definitions and what multi-employer work sites mean under California definition. And when are you going to be in hot water because of the situation of dual employment and you expose the worker or you have a multi-employer situation and you expose a worker to a hazard and they get hurt? Will you be cited or not? So I want, after this hour, I want you to have that clear. When will this cause a situation that is problematic, that could bring OSHA to your side and that will bring citations, penalties, et cetera? Number two, learning objective. I want you to review some of the most common injuries amongst temporary workers. That's important because it gives you a clue as to, darn, so I really haven't put more emphasis and I haven't been very specific about the training we provide our temp workers in this area of work, right? And so you're gonna be surprised, but that has to do with something that we uh, often ignore, and I'll talk about it in a moment. And number three, I need you to understand who's responsible for training. Are we going to leave it up to the 
staffing agency? Are we going to leave it up to the temp agency? Are we going to leave it up to the PEO organization? Are we going to leave it up to me, my own trainer? What are we doing? How are we going to provide training? How are we going to provide PPE? tools, equipment, all of that is really closely related. So those are my three objectives. If after this hour of our talk, I can get you to understand these three things. We've done a great job. We can go back and we have a checklist of what to do to improve our safety practices at our places of employment. Okay, great. Let's start. Let's just get to it, right? Dual employment under Kalosh definition is a situation. So dual employment is a situation it, where an employee, so one person at your facility, at your manufacturing plant, has two employers. How can that be? At the same time, this person has two employers, and both employers are potentially liable for a violative condition to which an employee has been exposed, and that's per Kalosha definition. So this can be clearly understand uh, understood. Oh, if, Alba, sorry, yeah. someone uh, asked a question if they're supposed to be seeing the objective slides or if we're on the right slide. We've already finished the learning objectives and now I'm going on to the dual employment under Kalosha's definition. So I hope you did get to see the learning objectives. Okay, I think so. It might have just been um, one person. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm on this slide that says dual employment under Kalosha's definition. So an easy way to think about this situation is you are a company who needs to fill, uh, to fill out some positions, let's say in your uh, conveyor belts, you need assembly workers. And so you decide that the best bet is to leave that up to a temp agency or a staffing agency and you get workers from them. So they manage their workers compensation issues. They provide you with information that they do training, safety training under OSHA regulations in your, yay, you're thinking this is great. I don't have to train them. They come in already trained under OSHA regulations. They have an injury and illness prevention program, so I don't have to have one. And that's when you start getting in trouble, okay? Because that employee that they're going to send you to work in your assembly line actually has two employers. The primary employer is the person that pays them so that's the person that keeps them in their payroll, and that would be the staffing agency. But the secondary employer would be you, the host employer, because on a daily basis, when they get to your place of, your place of employment to work on that assembly line, you're supervising the work. And you are actually taking a look at what they do it for either quality purposes, et cetera. You are responsible for that employee as well. So at that moment, that employee, although he or she is paid by the temp agency, he's yours. He is yours because you're responsible for their health and their safety as they work for you. So in the money you may find useful is a, pri a primary employer is that that processes payroll and a secondary employer is the, is the employer that is supervising at the site, he's supervising the employee. So I hope that's, that's clear to you. I know I have a couple questions there, unless it's regarding um, some of your, yeah, that's in regards to CUs, very good. So primary employer responsible for safety and health. Secondary employer is also fully responsible. Okay, so Cal OSHA makes this very clear. The primary employer will be responsible for the safety and health of their workers. So when that staffing agency is hiring for you, they take a look at their experience so that they know how to accommodate and, you know, direct those people where they're going to go, where they're going to send them to this employer or that employer. All right. Um, but they are in charge of their safety and health. So there are several things that they need to do as primary employer. And there's a list of those in the actual policy manual. And I'll, I'll show it to you. Um, the secondary employer is also fully responsible, so it is important for those two employers to talk and communicate, not just to have that contractual written uh, document that, that states where are they going to be responsible. For example, uh, just quickly, the primary employer may provide the secondary employer with a list of general safety topics that they provide training to their employees. So the employee you're receiving has already received this training because is written now that they've already received all that training. Mind you, the primary employer makes it very clear that this is general training. And then they tell you, secondary employer, that your responsibility is to provide them with the specific 
uh, training in regards to each of those topics. Uh, and they also want to make sure that before they start work at your facility, they have that new worker orientation for the purposes of safety, for the purposes of hazard recognition, so that that employee stays safe, right? So that's where that uh, wonderful communication occurs, not just in contractual language, but it happens in real practice, where you, safety coordinator at the host employer at your company, knows that they do come with general training, and you have to know that most of the time, temp agencies, good temporary or good uh, staffing agencies will provide with general safety training in most of the topics that OSHA requires safety training for that type of position or job. That's awesome. And that's great because the employee will come to you with some knowledge. So the specific training that you have to do is related to the hazards found and encounter while at that conveyor belt or while at that doing that assembly job. And you'll go through some of the hazard, hazard recognition. You may even go through doing a JHA job hazard analysis in order to determine what type of training you need to provide that is specific to the job. Sorry, right. Alba, someone's saying that uh, the slide is still on number seven. Is that correct? I'm on primary versus secondary employer. Okay. Is Okay. It says top three. I don't think people are seeing the right slide. Oh, that's very interesting. Like a glitch. Okay. Yeah, we see top three complete transparency means. Oh, okay. No, that's not even the right. Hold on. Yeah, I think people are having issues seeing it maybe on their end. Okay, do you see a blue screen? No. We see the slideshows. That's very, very odd. Okay. I'm actually glad you guys brought it up because this oh, is... Okay. Now we see this, the blue Cal OSHA and your temp workers. Okay, let's start all over again, guys. Thank you so much for telling me this. <laughs> you see, I love when you guys are paying attention. This is the topic. Uh, you know, everything I said stands. That's my disclaimer. Everything you heard stands. Those are my learning objectives, comprehending the difference between dual employment and multi-employer situations. Next, reviewing the most common types of injuries that temp workers go through and will bring OSHA to your site. And third, understanding who's responsible for training, PPE, et cetera. Now we're together. I'm sorry about that. Dual employment under Cal OSHA's definition right there on your screen. You will get a copy of these, by the way. That's on your screen. And then a mnemonic you may find useful is primary employer, processes payroll, secondary, supervises at the site, right? So now that we have that clear, because I've been talking about it, but this helps, this helps to see it visually, right? Primary versus secondary employer then. The primary employer is responsible for safety and health. Cal OSHA states it just like that. You're responsible for those temp workers, wherever you send them, they got to stay safe and healthy. And if they have an injury, there's a set of things that you have to do. And they're delineated in the policy manual by Cal OSHA. And I'll give you a copy of that by sending, sending you the link at the end of this presentation. You will see the actual link to that policy manual. Now, the secondary employer is also fully responsible. And the actual word fully, two words, fully responsible are in the policy manual. And that's where I was talking to you about making sure that you actually communicate with that primary employer beyond that contractual language, where it actually happens in real life, where it actually happens in real practice. What does this mean? It means you send me a worker and you tell me it's been OSHA trained or it has uh, gone through safety training, that you provide a list of those topics. By the way, request documentation. And as a host employer, as a secondary employer, you're the one hiring uh, those workers, temporary workers. Make sure that you know what topics they've been trained on the length of those sessions and the language in which the sessions were provided to the worker. That will give you an idea truly of how much they know. And then as they get to your site, you must provide that specific training. A lot of tools really help, such as the JSAs, right, for hazard recognition, et cetera, so that you actually provide good training that will protect the worker and, and keep them safe and healthy. Now, the secondary employer must treat their temporary workers as their own. So I was talking to one of my colleagues and I was telling him an example of when I find this to be just rattling for me. 
Many of my clients allow me to do uh, surprise audits or surprise inspections, which by the way, your staffing agency should be doing for you. So I go and I walk and I was doing this walk and then I find this lady at the OR because I was doing this at an ambulatory surgical center and I'm, I'm walking through taking a look at some of the safety issues and I find her cleaning and disinfecting an OR that it's been emptied out, et cetera. And she's all in P PPE. And then I, I wait a little bit till see if she is okay to, to come and talk to me. So she steps outside and I start interviewing her about some of the issues that I see because I didn't like the way she was um, using her gloves, meaning they were very tight. So they looked like it wasn't the right size for her. And she really had no idea how to take them off because as I observed her work, um, there was a lot of splashing going on and there was no technique applied to how to take off those gloves that wear what? Contaminated with blood and OPIM. Why? Because she was cleaning in the operating room after a surgery. So when I talked to her, I asked her, why wasn't she at my bloodborne pathogens training for the ambulatory center? And she says, uh, I didn't know there was a session. Right. So she was never there. She was never informed. She never uh, knew about the training. And so I go talk to the nurse director. The nurse says, oh, she's not mine. Don't worry about it. She's not one of our employees. She comes through a temp agency. <gasps> and that's when I go. Right. Because. She was relying on the temp agency to provide the training for the worker. Now, mind you. When she shows me documentation, the documentation shows that this worker has been trained in the topic of bloodborne pathogens. Once again, you need to assume as host employer that the training is going to be very general in nature and that you need to provide with specific training as they get to you. So since she's doing janitorial services in an OR, the bloodborne pathogens topic becomes something that you need to specifically train. And during your new worker orientation, as you see, and you guide that worker through her duties, you will see some of the issues. For example, it doesn't matter that she went through a bloodborne pathogens training on a screen and see, she finished and clicked that 30 minute session. She still doesn't know, and no one has gone through the proper technique to put on and take off gloves. Do you see how important this is? Because then she could have an issue where she is a uh, picking up, a, 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 I don't know, one of those um, trays with blood, et cetera, and she falls or gets splashed in her eyes or there's some needles in it and she gets pricked and she doesn't really know what to do. And then you have to go through all of the issues where who does she report this injury to? When there's an issue of primary employer versus secondary employer, that injury will be handled through the workers' compensation of the primary employer, meaning the staffing agency. But you, secondary employer, will put it on your log if it's a recordable OSHA injury. Ah, oh, and then we get into what's a recordable OSHA and what's not a recordable OSHA, which is, by the way, another webinar. We've, we've actually um, had a topic in a, one of those training sessions. So if you want to know and learn about how to fill out those logs, also request the class because it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to go over recordables versus non-recordables. But it does affect your safety record, okay? And every time you put one more recordable on that OSHA log, your OSHA incident rate will be affected. Right. And why is that a situation? Because nowadays we are since 2015, we're now submitting records to OSHA through a portal. So that summary of how many people get injured under your watch is received by OSHA. Right. So um, it's not like before where we just kept our records. Nobody knew. It's not like before where you actually, you know, tried to put everything under first aid and, and, and no one ever knew. Now, first aid records are, are also first aid injuries are also they need to be reported to your carrier. So a lot of these issues will go over if you have questions individually. But what is important for you to know is that once that employee gets hurt, because you were supervising that worker, it'll go in your OSHA log, not on the primary employer OSHA log. They will handle the workers comp. And I know that's one of the big, biggest advantages as to why you hired a temp agency or a staffing agency but it'll go on your OSHA log and it will affect your OSHA incident rate. Um, second, also when it's a recordable, many times you have people that get off work or they have to have some days off work and that affects your DART, right? Your days away or restrictive work. And um, all of that plays into if OSHA is going to keep you under the radar or not. 
Uh, X mods get affected many times. And if you already are in the high hazard industry list, the DART also shows how are you doing in comparison with all other high hazard uh, employers, right? And remember, Kalosha has a high hazard industry program where they, they target companies that are in this high hazard industry list to go and inspect. So some of these professional employment organizations, the PEOs, differ slightly from the temp agency or the actual staffing agencies because they're more complex, but their rules change and they kind of vary um, from the moment they started being created until now. So when Cal Ocean knows there's a PO situation going on, they will really go on a case by case basis. Uh, the contractual terms matter a lot. And what Cal Osha will take a look is, do you really go by what you put on your contract versus what's really happening in the workplace? And how do they verify that this checks? Um, if you said, for example, that you're going to be that the PEO, the professional employment organization is going to be handling the audits for safety and health, that they actually occur, right? And if your workers say, no, no one ever comes and does inspections, all we do is, you know, we get a, a, a trainer to come talk safety every quarter, for example, but we, we, I don't know what that is. So they interview workers and that's important because that's the way Kalosha will check that your contractual terms and the things you put in writing will actually happen in practice in, in real life, right? So here's your first step to compliance. What you want to do is set out your respective responsibilities for compliance with the applicable OSHA standards in your contract. What does that mean? For example, if you say you're gonna provide with the tools or if the workers from the PEO or the staffing agency are coming with their own PPE, who is going to check that the PPE is in good condition? Uh, who is going to check that the PPE is um, uh, provided not just um, in good condition, but that the workers had received training, training in regards to when, how to use it, how to put it on, what are the restrictions of that piece of equipment, et cetera. All of that needs to be set out in writing prior to you working with that agency or that PEO. So that's your first step to compliance. Now, the difference between dual employment and multi-employer work sites is that that worker at your site doesn't have two employers when it's a multi-employer situation. Why? Because a multi-employer situation happens most of the time when at the same geographical location, you have the painters, they have their own company and because they're their own entity, that's an employer. And then you have the scaffolders who also come from another company and they just happen to be together at the same location because they're all working at that same building. That's a multi-employer situation where if OSHA, let's say, gets there because there are some installers doing work and they, their company is under the high hazard industry list and they're it. OSHA has them in their list. They're scheduled to be inspected that day. They go to that location and they find the scaffold director, um, you know, not finishing the scaffold, putting a green tag, but there's some planks missing. Cal OSHA will actually include in there is inspection that scaffolding company. So now you have more employers involved in this inspection and the actual COSHA or Cal OSHA inspector will issue citations and will open up the inspection to those other employers. And so you will be cited and you will be included in it if you're the exposing employer, the correcting employer or the controlling employer. And these are the three different categories in multi-employer work sites. So, if you are the scaffolder company and you forgot to put those planks, you are the exposing employer and you'll be cited. But if you are the painter and you forgot to correct that issue, you did not call on these scaffolders to correct this, or you yourself did not put those planks back in place, uh, you failed to correct the hazard, you are what we call a correcting employer and you will be cited under the multi-employer situation uh, um, policy manual for Cal OSHA because you failed to correct the hazard. And as a controlling employer, if you are the uh, general contractor who doesn't have any policies to make sure that these things happen uh, and that the safety and health of the workers on site is procured, you will also be cited. So OSHA does this investigation to find out where are you at in regards to these three types of employers. And that's kind of like the the, the, the quick way of explaining multi-employer situation. Now, if you're the scaffolder and within your scaffolding company, while you're erecting 
collecting scaffolding, you hired some temporary workers. Ah, so now you have dual employment within that multi-employer work site, right? So you could have a multi-employer situation where each of those employers have a dual employment situation going on. And now it should be clear to you because a dual employment occurs when that one employee has two employers at the same time as they are doing their job, the staffing agency and the host employer, right? So this is how Kalosha sees things. They want to analyze it in order to know who should be issued the citation to, right? What I don't want you to fall back on is to say, well, you know, since they're not my employees and they told me they would be doing their safety and health uh, uh, inspections and they told me they would be doing the training and they would be doing the specific training for me and that's why I hire them. I don't have to do anything. I just need to make sure they show up for work. Kalosha specifically states in their policy uh, manual for the inspectors to conduct their inspections that no employer in California can delegate the responsibility of safety and health to another company. The moment those employees are there working for you and you're supervising their work, they're yours. They're yours and you will be cited just as if you were cited for one of your own employees in your own payroll. So now we move on to why OSHA plays so much emphasis on these workers, temp workers. And we see a lot of um, injuries and fatalities uh, as you go to the, what you see on your screen right now is the OSHA.gov site. And I like to put this as an example because the OSHA.gov uh, fatality data and statistics allows you to actually put the city, the state and the hazard description to take a look at what type of, um, injuries or what type of uh, uh, deaths have occurred in your county or in your state. So if I just put the word entangle because entanglement is one of the most frequently cited and why OSHA, Cal OSHA shows up at the workplaces because of an issue of a temp worker. Uh, so the reason why OSHA pays so much attention is, like I said, because there's been there are many reports of serious and fatal injuries suffered by temporary workers during their first days of work. There's no doubt. And many, many times the reason is because these workers come with some training, some experience. But think about it this way. Every company is different. Every process is different. It's, I could be an assembly worker for a shoe company and then I... I'm put to work for another manufacturing company that assembles, um, you know, metal parts to make, uh, you know, cars or metal parts to make computers. The actual processes are so different, although the title, the job title is the same. So because of the specificity of the hazards for the different job position, I may be hurt during my first days of work because no one trained me specifically on recognizing those hazards and how to control them. So there is a lack, most of the time, OSHA finds that there is a lack of delineation, the contractual responsibilities for safety. And, you know, it's kind of like you continue to point fingers and say, well, they told me they were going to do this. It's in the contract. Uh, I didn't know I was supposed to do this. They told me they did it in Spanish, but it just happens that they never did it in Spanish. And I thought, you get the picture. Temp workers are new workers several times a year. Like I said, because they're new workers several times a year and statistics say that the highest amount of injuries and death at work occurs amongst new employers, OSHA immediately puts emphasis on temporary workers. So there's a description about an incident and just as an example of how people get hurt. Let me share this one with you. I believe I have this one on Safari. So I'm going to share that. And Lindsay, if you wouldn't mind checking the chat, maybe I have some questions there that I haven't addressed. No, no questions right now. OK, so let's see here. I think I have that. I want to make sure I show you that. Um, ta -da. Or is that? Here it is. So a temporary worker was fatally injured after falling through a sugar hopper and becoming engulfed by sugar. The fatality occurred in a marine cargo warehouse operation where bulk granulated sugar from ships is transported to the warehouse for storage, bagging, and distribution. Sugar clumps often prevented the sugar from flowing freely through a hopper onto a conveyor belt during bagging. 
two or three times per shift, workers would manually break up the clumps. This fatal incident occurred when the temporary worker was breaking up sugar clumps with a pole shovel while standing on a hardened sugar bridge at the top of the hopper. There's the figure. And so obviously he didn't know the hazards. The sugar bridge collapsed as the worker fell to the bottom of the hopper. His legs went through the chute where he was engulfed by sugar and suffocated. I love this, not that I love the incident, don't get me wrong. I love that OSHA highlights now the causes, the likely causes. There was a corporate safety program, but it was not implemented at the work site. Okay, because who's the host employer? The company, the sugar company, right? Uh, who And they are the secondary employer. But the primary employer is the staffing agency. The host employer did not provide workers with a safe and healthful work environment. They did have a corporate safety program, but they were not implementing at that particular site. Number two, there were no specific safe work procedures for breaking up sugar clumps. And this is where this we're highlight again, specific training is needed once that worker, that temp worker gets to you. Remember, they want to impress you. They don't want you to kick them out of their site. So if you ask a question such as, you okay with this? You've done this before? They're gonna say yes. They're gonna say yes. Don't, do not. You say, hi, how are you? So and so you're still doing your new worker orientation. And now we're going to show you how to break the sugar, sugar lumps. I know you've done this job in the past, but this is how we do it here. That's where the specificity of training comes into place. And that's what needs to be in writing as well. The hopper and shoot openings were not guarded to protect workers from falling into the hopper and being engulfed by sugar, which has to do with what? Regular audits to take a look at what are the hazards in the jobs that your workers are going to be. And guess what? Your temp agency should be doing those audits before they start providing you with workers. How many workers do you need? Where are they going to be working? May we do an audit to take a look at the hazards around that area so that we can find out, um, um, we can put it in writing and send the workers that you need? There was no safe method or walkway to reach the top of the hopper and there was no safe work platform at the top. Worker had to reach a height of more than 13 feet to break up the sugar clumps. The workers, mostly temporary, did not receive appropriate safety and health training and the supervisor was also temporary, also a temporary worker, did not receive training in assessing potential workplace hazards and instructing other workers in how to avoid unsafe conditions. And this is huge because when a supervisor doesn't know your appeal, uh, your appeal process gets greatly affected because now you're not going to get a lot of those deductions that Kalosha allows during the appeals process to either reduce or go or, or make citations go away for good faith because you cannot appeal a, a citation that was or an injury that was committed by a um, supervisor someone that represents the company. They are the ones that should be doing the job of making an injury illness prevention program effective, right? Okay, so let's get back to where I was because this highlighted the importance of, of specific training, specific training. So April 29, 2013, temporary protecting temporary workers went up on the OSHA page and then Cal OSHA put it on their main page and it's number two, put it right there on Cal OSHA. If you go to Cal OSHA, homepage is bullet point number two, protecting temporary agency employees. So a lot of good fact sheets and a lot of great links for you to take a look at if you go there, okay? So, uh, hold on, where was I? Ah, I know what I'm doing. I'm clicking on the link again. So what happens when a temporary work, worker gets hurt under your supervision and your, under your supervisor's watch? Kalosha will revise your written contracts, will immediately notify their legal department when a PEO is involved, will note differences between contractual terms and actual practices. And if you were supervising this worker, once again, the actual injury will go on your OSHA log, right? It doesn't matter that the workers' compensation system uh, kicks in on the other side, on the side of the temporary agency. You still get stuck with that OSHA reportable. And then the uh, OSHA or the COSHO, which we say is a compliance health and safety officer will actually issue citations because you failed to protect that worker against the hazard. Once again, who is responsible for training? Both primary and secondary employers. The primary employer provides general training. This is something I wanted to emphasize today. Don't rely on the fact that they are providing training 
just because they tell you in writing and because they provide you a list of topics. Include them in all of your training sessions and also make sure that you do specific training, especially when you're going through the new worker orientation process. They need to have a clear idea of how to recognize the hazards and how to control them, right? And then the secondary employer provides specific training that is documented. And I gave you that example on how, you know, that he needed to know how to break the sugar clumps, but no one trained him. It's just like, you just ask, you know how to do this. It's a little bit like saying to a, a, a person that you're going to assign to drive a forklift. You've driven these before, haven't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. That's why the temp agency said, no problem, get, get behind the wheel. We know better, right? We put them through a actual program mandated by Cal OSHA, Power Industrial Trucks, Classroom training, hands-on evaluation. And for those that show efficient, that have been trained classroom training the past three years, you make sure that you do hands-on evaluation, find out that they know what they're really doing and provide them with a card or documentation that someone observed them doing the job safely, right? So request a list of the curriculum from your temp agency. Ask, how long did it take them to train these people? What language, right? It'll give you a good idea of, of uh, how good of a job they're doing. For the use of personal protective equipment for temporary workers, you provide them, you're responsible for their condition of the uh, PPE. You, pro you are also responsible for the actual condition of all of their tools, portable powered equipment, and any other issues that they're provided to do their job, right? If you allow them to bring their own stuff, you're still responsible for it. It's in both regulations, the one that is personal protective devices, which relates to personal protective equipment, 3380, section 3380. And it's also in the other regulations for hand uh, and, and power tools and equipment. Kalosh is very clear about these things. They are all, anything that they work with, Host employer is responsible for the condition of these items so that they're in good condition and the worker knows how to utilize them, what are the actual uh, hazards when using them, uh, the life of this equipment. There's an actual requirement for all of this, and it's your job. So once again, I go back to even if the temp agency provided you with a list, and in the list it said that they provided training regarding personal protective equipment, you go back and you do specific training, especially if you're, let's say, put them to work in an area where they're going to be doing welding, soldering, and they're gonna be using a respirator. Don't assume that because they come with a, a training in PPE that they've been taught how to wear a respirator because there's several issues there, right? With respirators, now you get into why are they wearing a respirator? Uh, if this is not on a voluntary basis, now you have to have a formal program. They have to be fitted annually. You have to make sure that uh, you have a, a medical evaluation for those workers. They need to know how to put it on, take it off, et cetera. It's an actual separate safety program on your own. Do not leave that to the temp agency. That's yours, he's yours. You treat him as if he was one of your other workers that you pay. That, that are on your payroll. Oh, and there are some of the sections that I promised to put there, uh, 3556 for tools and equipment and 3384 PPE. So what does it say? Cal OSHA says, no matter what you give them, you know, employer, each employer shall be responsible for the safe condition of tools and equipment, including tools and equipment, which may be furnished by employees. So even if they bring it on site, you do an audit. And you do periodic audits to make sure that they're bringing good stuff to the work sites. So we talked about already about who fills out the OSHA 300. And in this case is if you're supervising the employee, he gets hurt under your watch, it goes on your OSHA log, even if you don't pay that work. And I hope that's clear. There is a list of um, definition as to what constitutes first aid versus medical treatment because first aid is not to be logged. It doesn't, it's not, a, it's not to be a recordable per OSHA, right? But there is a list of what is, what constitutes recordable injury. And you need to know how to record this. This is an easy form. It's an easy form. Nevertheless, it's got some interesting issues such as how many days sh should you be counting? How do you update this actual um, uh, forms, et cetera? If you don't know, do not know how to fill out this 300 OSHA log, or you don't even know if you should be filling it out, give us an email, send us an email, give us, uh, uh, send us a question, because 
um, sometimes you're under the false belief that you don't have to fill out these documents because there's a partial exemption. There's a list of, um, of classification under the North American industry classification that are partially exempt, that you do not have to fill out these records. So ask us if you have a question in this regard, but if it's a temp worker, it's important for you to know that if he gets hurt under your supervision, you must put it on your log. So now talking about how uh, these workers get hurt, the most often types of injuries or the injuries that we see the most are amputations and entanglement and other uh, uh, injuries of this type. Uh, and this is because, like I said, you know, these workers come with some experience in this area of work, but a lot of the times the host employer lacks the policies that will allow workers to stay safe. For example, the kind of clothing that they can wear, how to keep their hair tight in a ponytail if they wear long hair. So there's a lot of entanglement issues. And we have a real case of a fatality here. And this is from the Cal OSHA fact sheet. Temporary worker died from being entangled with the exposed rotating shaft of a mixer while mixing industrial adhesive. Had the host employer identified and safeguarded the worker against the hazard of working near the mixer, he would be alive today. So these types of injuries most of the time cause deaths, amputations, and entanglements. They relate to the issue of guarding and they relate to the issue of lockout tagout. I cannot tell you how many times I am hired to go to this job sites where there are pieces of equipment and machinery missing guards because someone removed them. And sometimes it has nothing to do with taking shortcuts. They just remove them because they needed to fix a glitch without the appropriate lockout tagout procedure and they don't put it back. And workers don't know that this is incorrect, that this is not allowed, or there are just you know panels, electrical panels that are open, you know, and 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 energized parts are exposed, and people don't close those panels because there's no real audits happening, there's no effectiveness, effect, effectiveness, my goodness gracious, uh, of that injury and illness prevention program because that's what Kalosha wants to see, not that you just have beautiful written language for your injury and illness prevention program, um, they wanna see the beautiful language married with actual practices. So that when they walk your site, they can see truly that there are signs, danger, only authorized personnel. So if someone doesn't walk through a door that may expose that worker unnecessarily, that they see danger electrical equipment and there's the clearance and it's well lit, well marked, et cetera. Things like that tell them that all of your electrical panels say what does each switch belong to, et cetera. That's all part of that effectiveness, right? In your in your injury in illness prevention program. Uh, the link to this particular uh, fact sheet is also at the end of this presentation and is how to protect temporary agency employees per Cal OSHA uh, wording language, et cetera. So you send them to work. So it tells you a little bit of what I explained right now. And it talks about both are responsible for following California laws. And it gives you a list, uh, links to the Title A code of uh, regulations there. What else is it, do they have here? Topics for primary employers. And who's the primary employer? The staffing agency, right? But primary employers need to make sure they do let they have that good communication. And so once they start sending workers to you, you should expect that temporary agency or staffing agency to have constant communication, constant communication going back and forth, back and forth. And one of the biggest issues is if an incident occurs, you must make sure that your temp agency knows, right? Why? Because they should have a safety specialist that follows through with that investigation that also comes on site to make recommendations, to work with you for the safety and health of employees so that it doesn't ever happen again, right? So this is a very good fact sheet that kind of summarizes what we've uh, discussed up until now. And you will have the link, like I said, at the end of the slides. Um, so to protect your company, one of the key things that I want you to do is 
improve your relationship with your staffing agency. And if you could take three things that will help you improve that relationship, the, the top three, and, and this is thanks to a colleague, uh, safety specialist that helped me so much to understand, you know, I, I, we really want to have a good relationship with our host employers. And one of the main things that will get the job done is that communication. So number one, if you work with a temp agency or a staffing agency, ensure that they have a safety specialist on board. That's it. That's number one. This, their safety specialist should be your best friend and your best resource, right? They should have a specific written out list of things that they're going to be going over with you. And they should be the ones doing the audits, being on site with you, walking your floor, knowing the job that they are going to be providing the workers uh, to do the job for you. And they should be able to also make recommendations and you should be able to go back and forth to actually follow through with those recommendations. A communicate doesn't mean that everything he or she says and spits out to you is going to be the right recommendation. It just means they think there's a hazard. So let's work on it. Let's see how we can actually get to a compromise where we fix this and control the hazard. Many, many brains work better than just one, right? Ensure there's transparency, right? So number two, so number one is make sure that they have a safety specialist and that he comes with a delineated set of functions, right? List of audits, how they're gonna do whenever there's an incident, when are they gonna come to your site, weekly, monthly, quarterly, you need to know that. The next thing is ensure there's transparency. That communication is key. Make sure it's in writing, make sure it really happens. And I would say number three, is ensure that your workers know, uh, when I say your workers, I'm talking about temp workers, that they know and they don't forget the process to actually report a work-related injury or illness. Because many times, once they put the shirt on and say, we're you know, working for such and such company, they put the, the team shirt on and they, they forget a little bit about the staffing agency, right? And when an injury occurs, they know that the employer is responsible, but they forget about the staffing agency. So make sure that for all these temp workers, there's the clear understanding on how to report this work-related injuries. Okay, so clarify that confusion. And when we talked about that safety specialist, make sure that they perform joint audits with you, walk the floor with them, uh, perform joint JSAs or JHAs, however you want to call them, which are the job safety analysis of, or job hazard analysis, where you are going to be given that chance and opportunity to see if you missed any hazards and where that specific training is needed. Make sure they do follow through with that incident investigation. Once a temp worker is injured, man, you know, they, it's a headache for everyone and no staffing agency wants that. So they want to prevent it from ever happening and make sure that you have that connection so that you can work together to give recommendations short and, and, and those recommendations should be short term, long term, so that it, it, it really is controlled. The hazard is not there anymore and no more workers get hurt, either yours or temp workers. It shouldn't happen again. And that's the, the gem and the beauty of incident investigation. Something is investigated so that it never happens again. Uh, ask them to provide recommendations and follow through, follow through. So that means point the finger at somebody to get the job done. And when I say point the, point the finger, I'm not talking about pointing them who's at fault. No, 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 no. Because incident investigation is all about finding a solution. When I say point a finger, that has to do with the recommendations. That means so-and-so, you're going to be responsible for ordering the new parts. So-and-so, you make sure you're going to be preparing a new training curriculum because that's why they got hurt because we didn't know that we have a mixture of, you know, young guys, older guys, or, you know, a language barrier there. Whatever it is, you give a person responsible for correcting that issue and you make sure that it happens. And if you have meetings, safety meetings, you make sure you're checking. It's, it's a system of check and balances, right? When did you get it done? How did you get it done? Why is it not getting done? So that no one gets hurt again. So this picture I put here just because I just also visited a company who allowed me to see how they do their job. And when I follow through with them, they had a flow chart. And the workers don't have any written documents in their, um, don't have any written documents on their phones or on their um, uh, trucks, work trucks, but they do have a smartphone. A lot of you give smartphones to your workers. Make sure that they have a way to know what to do in case they get hurt. Since we don't get hurt, hurt every day and we don't have emergencies every day, 
workers forget how to report an injury or what to do during an emergency. So make sure that with the touch of a button, they can access the list of emergency numbers and that the emergency number includes that liaison with your temp agency, your, your staffing agency, so that they know, oh yeah, right, I have to tell the temp agency as well. So that's key, very crucial because what I found out through some of these audits and walks is that because we don't get hurt every day, um, we don't know if our system for reporting injuries is actually very good. Uh, and uh, workers many times when they're out there in the field, they, they really don't have those numbers handy or they need a password to get to those programs or to that information. And they don't forget their password. They forget their password. So give them a sure way to get to emergency numbers, uh, especially for those temp workers, which they need to reported not just to you, but also to the staffing agency. Okay, so as I promised, those are the resources for the safety manager. And I apologize for that um, mishap with the slides. I was preparing it separately and that's what you were seeing. But this is the finished product. This is what you will get today as part of attending uh, with each of, uh, for each of you. Any questions at this point? I'm gonna go ahead and stop the, the recording. Or Lindsay, if you could stop 